Hey, hey, lovely humans. Welcome back to my mini-series. If this is your first time tuning in, I'll go ahead and quickly introduce myself. My name is Dana Strickland. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Arizona, a certified clinical trauma professional, or CCTP, and an injury certified therapist and consultant in training. So far, we've covered the neurophysiological response to stress, i.e. fight, flight, or freeze. We've defined trauma and talked about what complicates it. In this episode, we'll be covering the Adaptive Information Processing, or AIP model, which is the foundation of EMDR. Next episode, we'll talk about what EMDR actually is and do a rundown of its eight phases. Finally, we'll end on some resourcing or grounding activities that you can use to help yourself and your clients. Let's get rolling. Anyone who has used a computer or a smart device has some kind of idea about what cookies are. If you don't, cookies are electronic data packets that store, send, and receive information without altering it. If you've noticed that you've friended or followed someone online and then started getting suggestions for people you may know, or if your phone is allowed to track your location and you use it in the store, school, doctor's office, etc., then you start getting even more suggestions for people you may know, then you've experienced the effect of cookies. The cookie hasn't changed the data, but adaptations of internet algorithms designed to keep you engaged and consuming has applied a meaning to those cookies by assuming that because you know or follow one person that you must know or might like to follow the people that they are connected to, even if you don't actually have any mutual connections. An association has been made. So the more friends you have in common, the more associations are made, and the more likely it is that social media will insist that you know all these other people and will continue to suggest them as friends no matter how many times you mark those profiles as, I don't know this person. As a side note, location tracking on your phones is one of the biggest ways that people violate their own privacy. So when you're going to a medical or a counseling appointment, turn that mess off. You're welcome. The human brain is the original cookie system, and just like our smart devices that use data to sell us things, our human brains create associations between pieces of data all the time by placing value judgments and other perceptual filters on that information based off of our previous adaptations. This leads humans to often disregard information that doesn't align with what we already believe to be true. And as a result, we wind up making a lot of faulty assumptions when, and then reacting to things in a way that can be at times problematic. We have an experience either positive or negative, and based on whether that experience was safe or unsafe, that experience impacts our beliefs about ourselves, significant people in our lives, the broader community or the world in general, the meaning of certain events, actions, and behaviors, and our concept of or our willingness to believe in a higher power. Our prefrontal cortex would assume that we would sort and store this information in some sort of a logical filing system, like putting your books or movies in alphabetical order or sorting music by the artist or band name. No, the human brain does not work that way. Because the brain takes in and reacts first to physical sensations, then thoughts, then urges and actual behaviors, and based upon the intensity of those reactions, we decide what to name our emotions, our brain sorts information more like this. So logically, we would assume that our brain would store memories and information alphabetically by genre, by band name, by color, or by shape. We would say this thing has to be exactly like this thing or be very similar for them to be grouped together. That's a front brain concept. That's a, a made up man-made logic kind of concept. So how our brain is actually wired to work is based off of adaptation, what certain things mean and how we need to survive those situations. And if you think back to how our brain takes in and processes information, it starts with sensations first. So situation A, leaving for work or for school, the car won't start, it makes me late. Physically what's happening, I start to hold my breath, my jaw is clenched, my fists are clenching, my throat feels tight, a headache starts to form at the temples because I'm clenching my jaw, my stomach is tight and I get that sinking feeling, my chest and my face are flushed and hot. 
Based off of these sensations, I start to have thoughts that I'm not in control, I'm going to get behind, and I'm going to be in trouble. The emotions that come up are that I'm worried and that I'm stressed out. So we sit with situation A. Situation A then gets compounded by situation 1A. Very similar, I'm stuck in traffic because of roadblocks, closed lanes, and then I managed to hit every red light on my route. Similar to the first experience, I'm holding my breath, my jaw is tight and it's clenched and I'm grinding my teeth. I definitely have a headache and it's starting to form around the temples. My stomach is tight and my fists are clenching around the steering wheel and my arms are getting tight. I'm having thoughts of, I'm not in control, I'm going to get behind, I'm gonna get in trouble, I don't like how crowded these roads are, I don't like how other people drive, people don't drive safely, people don't care, and people suck. I'm experiencing the emotions of being worried, being stressed out, defensive, kind of probably judgmental too because I'm judging how other people are driving and telling myself I'm definitely a better driver than they are and I'm starting to get angry if I'm not already there. That's a pretty full cup, huh? Even before we get to the urges and actual behaviors. Pretty full cup. So that's experience one that's compounded by 1A. Now we have experience B. So in experience B, I've had a really busy day. I've been feeling rushed and behind. I skip lunch. I'm hangry and I'm still behind even though I skipped lunch to try to get caught up. My boss asked me to do five more things and says, they'll only take a minute. What is my body doing? My whole head hurts and it's pounding. I'm getting dehydrated and my mouth is dry. My stomach is tight and it hurts because I'm hangry. So if we notice that the, the similar sensation is around the headache and that my stomach is tight. Now let's check in with the thoughts. I work too much. My boss doesn't care. I can't ask for help. I don't have enough time. Hunger is less important than being productive. I'm not important. And about that, I feel overwhelmed, I feel angry, and I feel resentful. So this cup, not as full as the first one because the first one was already compounded, but it's kind of full. We got some colors going on in there. And if we think back to the fact that situation B, even though is very different from situation A, there's still some similar thoughts and some similar sensations. So our brain says, guess what? B goes with A, same thing. So now that we know that situation B is going to be paired with situations A and 1A, let's introduce situation C. See if you can spot the similarities and the differences. In experience C, you walked out of the room or you turned your back for less than three minutes. You come back or you turn around to find that your child or your pet has made a huge mess. It's not gonna come up easily. It had definitely stained or ruined something. <sighs> Sensations first. Our jaws clenched and our teeth are grinding. Our arms are tight, but we're trying not to clench our fists. My back hurts and my hips are tight. I'm holding my breath, but I'm being very intentional about making sure I'm breathing. I'm having thoughts about why did I think that was a good idea? I don't have time for this. I don't get breaks because I have to take care of everyone else. I'm not important. I'm feeling frustrated, defeated, angry, shame because I don't want to be angry in front of them and I don't want to lash out when I'm angry. So then I feel guilty and I also feel some sadness. Even though C is different from B, 
A and 1A, there are similar emotions, physical sensations, and thoughts, so our brain says, guess what? They're all the same. Isn't that cute? So we'll notice, initially, D is still separate from A, 1A, B, and C. As we're walking through the situation, notice the similarities and the differences. In experience D, you wake up and your body hurts. It even hurts to get out of bed. You're walking like a 100-year-old cowpoke who's been riding a horse nonstop for 84 years. The pain is going to slow you down for most of the day, if not all of your day. So the physical sensations are a physical pain, stiffness in your back, knees, and feet. Your thoughts, I'm not in control. My work and obligations are more important than me being in pain. My, the emotions are frustration, anger, sadness, shame, and feeling defeated. Did you catch the similarities? So even though on paper it's a completely different experience, guess what? Brain put them together because it felt the same. Okay. So now moving on to experience E, which we see is a different cup from A, 1A, B, C, and D. In experience E, you have an argument or disagreement with a friend or a significant other. This is not a new disagreement. It's not likely to get resolved today. They're hurt, you're hurt, both of you might be acting a little bit stubborn. So what are the physical sensations? My eyes are definitely bugging. I'm trying not to clench my jaw. I have a sinking tight feeling in my stomach. My chest and my face are flushed and they're hot. I'm having thoughts about why won't they just hear me? I feel like I have to make everybody happy. And because of that, I feel less important than everybody else. About that, I feel some stress because I can't make everybody happy. I feel upset because I really need them to just hear me. I'm sad because I need them to hear me and I know in this moment that I'm not hearing them. I'm also angry. I'm worried about how many more times can we have this disagreement before the relationship kind of goes sideways or some kind of other irreparable damage happens. And I feel guilty. So. If you spotted some of those similarities, they were there, so guess what? And that's how adaptive information processing works. It feels the same, so our brain says it must be the same. Repeated similar experiences, physical sensations, beliefs about ourselves, others, the world, etc. build and reinforce connections, creating learned responses and reactions. So what does adaptive information processing even mean? It means that information comes in, we make an adjustment based on that so we can keep functioning as normally as possible. And if that same information keeps showing up, we make more permanent adjustments based on what we've decided that information means. So when you think of the word adaptive or adaptation, think about survival, coping, or how you made it work. Even if what you did is not the safest or healthiest choice, and association. Associations can be beneficial because it allows us to apply what we've learned from previous experiences to help us navigate new ones, similar to how understanding addition and subtraction helps students learn multiplication. The human brain is an association-making machine whose one job is to keep us alive and reasonably comfortable. The simplest way to put this is this, if you've ever accidentally touched a hot stove and burned yourself, you've now learned that hot stove equals physical danger. Next time, you'll look to see if the stove is off before you've touched or set something down on the top. Changing behavior to increase the likelihood of safety and survival equals adaptation. This is also demonstrated by the concept six degrees of separation, which is the theory that posits that all human beings in the world are just six or fewer social connections away from one another. You may be familiar with this theory because of the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. If you've ever played a game using any form of free association, 
You know how this works. Just like trauma, basically everything else in our world is pretty subjective, meaning that the links or associations that I make between one thing and another may be very different than the links that you've made, but neither of our associations is necessarily wrong. They just happen to be what's true for us. The Adaptive Information Processing, or AIP, model is based on this exact process. AIP states that we have experiences, we learn something from them, and we adapt, meaning that we change our behaviors based on what we've learned that we need to do in order to avoid danger or discomfort. A personal example of this is that a long time ago, I ate at a certain restaurant whose name features a popular breakfast food. I had strawberry pancakes. I got food poisoning. I avoided that particular restaurant's food for a while. Someone wanted to go there and I said, okay, but let's go to a different one because last time I got sick. We go to a different location. I order something completely different. I get food poisoning again. I avoid that restaurant for an even longer period of time. Then in another city altogether, I'm with a group. Group wants to go eat at this restaurant chain. I'm hesitant, but the majority rules, so okay. I order something completely different from the first two times. I get food poisoning again. By now, I have learned that no matter what location of that restaurant I go to, no matter what I order, I'm going to get sick. So I don't ever eat at that restaurant again because I've made the adaptation or the association that that restaurant equals me getting sick and the food's not good enough that it's worth getting sick for. So AIP, i.e. how the human brain is wired to work. The more often we have repeated similar experiences, the more neuronal connections are strengthened. We wind up with a super highway of neurons making connections to a certain type of reaction, and the more it gets reinforced, the more general the beliefs and behaviors become. The symptoms of anxiety, depression, somatic issues can become chronic. The more likely we are to experience issues like IBS, acid reflux, migraine, jaw pain, grinding or clenching of teeth, back, neck pain, weight gain, kidney problems, sleep problems, chronic pain, other long-term health issues, and increased likelihood of alcohol and substance abuse, and the more likely we are to experience problems in our relationships. To recap, the Adaptive Information Processing, or AIP, model means that information is introduced to the human brain, we experience physical sensations, thoughts, emotions, urges, and actual behaviors, and then apply a meaning to that information based on whether or not the experience was safe and secure or unsafe and insecure. As we grow and continue to have new experiences, we adapt by surviving, learning to make it work, and make associations or connections between information so that we're able to survive and navigate new experiences without having to work harder than we need to. Thank you again for tuning in to this episode of the mini-series covering Adaptive Information Processing, or AIP model. Next episode, we'll be covering what's EMDR and breaking down its eight phases. Thank you.